Hi, everybody, and welcome to 2021. And on behalf of Packet Fusion, I'm Ellen Penske, and I want to thank you for joining us on our first Packet Fusion Roundtable of the Year. For those of you who have attended our events in 2020, you'll notice that this year's format has been enhanced to include a lot more engagement. We call it our roundtable because each month, Packet Fusion CEO, Matt Pingator, is going to be talking with other industry experts and notables on a wide variety of subjects. And we're gonna be talking about industry trends, resources, and customer stories. So joining Matt today are Bill Franklin, who's a Senior Director of Cloud Engineering, and Alex Stanish, who's a Cloud Consultant. Matt is recognized in the industry as a visionary and is known for his 100% customer-first perspective. He's seen Packet Fusion through many transitions, and he's adapted and pivoted with the times by staying on top of emerging technologies and knowing how they'll shape the future. He not only knows how to talk technical, but he understands technology. We know that for a fact. Bill Franklin is a senior director of engineering. He's extremely well-rounded and a jack of all trades, especially when it comes to sales engineering from IAAS to SD-WAN. Bill has a unique story as he has many years of experience at EMC, NetApp, and CDW, which gives him a deep knowledge of today's premises-based technologies. Uh, he also understands from a business perspective the challenges that IT face today and how each customer should approach cloud transformation. I've also heard that he's known for winning at the whiteboard. Is that right, Bill? And he's most comfortable challenging and consulting IT executives with a few different colored markers. Maybe we'll hear some of that or see some of that today. And also with us is cloud solutions consultant, Alex Stanish. Alex approaches the IT industry with a forward thinking Silicon Valley mindset. He's a history buff, so he understands legacy infrastructure but he was also raised in a cloud first world. So he appreciates the value of both. His passion is helping customers navigate the often confusing, complex and ever-changing world of technology. So those are our panelists today. We've got a great session. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt to start our great discussion. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate it. Welcome everybody, 2021. We're going to uh, make it better than 2020. <laughs> I don't know how it can't be. So a um, lot of fun stuff. We're changing a little bit of this format. It's going to be more roundtable-ish. So it's basically open dialogue. We love questions and answers. Hit us up. Um, you know, we'll do them. We'll try to take the questions as they come in. If they're not perfectly timed, we'll kind of wait to the end of the Q&A. So please, please, please ask questions. Um, Ellen, one of the things you said in my write-up in my bio is that adaptation. So thank you. That was a new write-up for me. I hadn't heard that one. So um you know, adaptation is huge right now, right? Everybody's learning to adapt. And quite frankly, I've been adapting our business plan for, for 20 years. And, you know, we've been started in the premise-based physical blinky lights, hardware support of basically phone systems. And we had a single phone system, predominantly from Shortel. Um, and we went to our customers and understood their needs and try to solve their problems with a product. And it worked and it worked great. And you know, you can see the visual in front of you. All I had was a hammer, so everything looked like a nail. And, and the paradigm is, has changed um, today, right? So I question, what, was what I was doing correct? Was it adding value? Of course. I've added a ton of value over the years for the relationships I've fostered, else I wouldn't be where I am today. But knowing how we do things today is so much more, it's so much better. It's just like I, I can now truly understand my customers' needs, and I'm not shoehorned with one product to try to solve those needs. So I question today when people are running processes themselves, the customers and they have to go to a single vendor and the single rep comes in and provides a solution based on their, their, their service. Is that, is that sales rep, is that company doing the right thing for the customer? Sure, of course, as best they can. But it is in the, the sales reps and the customers, I mean, the, 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 the vendor's best interest to get their product installed and you paying them. So oftentimes the people, the best salespeople 
win deals, not actually the best technology or what's right for your company. So it's been a big paradigm shift for us, right? So, oh, wow, that uh, flipped upside down. So the right tool for every job. No, it's good. Um, basically, now I don't have a single product, right? We still support some Mitel, Shortel stuff for sure. But our install base of 700 customers has, beg has been begging for us to take them to the cloud, you know, over the last five years. It started off with just predominantly phone systems in the cloud, which is unified communications as a service. Our contact center division, which we have a ton of Genesis customers, they've asked us to take them to the cloud for the CCAS contact center as a service. And then because these things are now in the cloud, we've had to develop practices that now are on the WAN, the SD-WAN and the SASE and the networking, if you will, to get these cloud applications delivered to the, to the, to the enterprise. So now we are very much knee deep into the, into the cloud-based connectivity, along with security and colo and hyperscale. We're gonna to get to all that. But the concept is I no longer have a single product, right? I have multiple products in all these different arenas to come up with a holistic approach to solve the customer's needs. So no longer am I this one little sliver of a pie of the solution for the customer, we now get to come in and give an overall solution based on multiple, sometimes single products, MSPs, which we'll get to in a minute, but more often than not, we're taking the best of breeds of the SD-WAN or the security or the SAS or the UCAS, CCAS, bringing them all together with a nice plan for them to get forward. So what, what is all this stuff, right? To me, this is basically a digital transformation, right? We at Packet Fusion are helping our customers digitally transform. This was the funnest little word for the longest time. It's still very, very relative. But what is it, right? To me, it's nothing more than business transformation, right? It's a new descriptive for, let me launch this poll. It's a new, I'm gonna move it here. It's, a, it's basically a new description for something we've been doing for a long time. Digital transformation is nothing more than business transformation, right? Don't be, don't be scared of it. So we're all doing, we're all constantly refining our business. We're constantly trying to get better. You either do it better with more top line or you do it with better bottom line. More efficiencies, more efficiencies it goes right to the bottom line. We're helping with all that with business transformation. These new tools that you get to use for this digital transformation, we're gonna talk about all of them here in a little bit. It's not enough to just say, hey, I bought SAP, I bought Salesforce, I bought Palo Alto Networks, I bought Ring Central. Just cause you buy it doesn't mean it's like gonna solve your needs or solve your problems, right? You have to have this blend and there's so many things that go into a successful rollout of any of these projects. We don't even have time for that. We, have, we actually have a, um, a presentation on the pitfalls for cloud, an hour on what's gone wrong with cloud deployments. It's a pretty fun one. Um, but really the digital transformation success is when you blend all three of these, the process, the tools, and the people, right? The tools are only as good as the people that can use them. They're only good as the processes that you put behind the tools that the people get to use. So these three together are, are what makes a success. Oftentimes, vendors, P uh, customers will buy a product from a, from a vendor and they'll put it in as best they can, right? But where we come in, we've done this so many times for so many different customers, we can offer our services to blend these three together to make sure things are, are going where, the, where they're supposed to go and get the value out of it. So look, has COVID affected your digital transformation strategy? 90% said yes, 10% said no, I'm gonna find the 10% that said no, and I gotta to talk to you, right? Um, I, I, I love it, I'm sure there's circumstances for that, uh, but pretty interesting. So 90% said yes, it, it, it has affected our, uh, has affected it. So very cool, I'm gonna end that poll. Right. Oh, I guess I can share the results there, that's pretty cool. Um, so I will stop sharing. And so now we're gonna go, keep going. So if you didn't have a digital transformation pre-COVID, you certainly have one now. 
Um, you know, this came from uh, the Microsoft CEO basically said more digital transformation has occurred in the last six months than in the last five years. And they're expecting this exact same thing to happen. The next six months will go even back further. So we're supposed to have more digital transformation in the next six months than we had in the last six months. So, you know, quite frankly, our business is, is doing very well. Um, it's sometimes, um, what's the right word, embarrassing in social circles to talk about doing well today's day of world with so many people suffering. Um, I, I don't wish you know ill will on anybody, but we're we're doing we're doing very well in today's society. So we're we're leading the the, the cloud initiative and people to be able to work from home. So a couple other questions: Is technology an inhibitor of growth, or is it fuel growth? Right. This is just a a fundamental, a fundamental decision that a mindset that you guys have to deal with or understand at your company, right? So the next, our next poll, let's start this one, is do you, do you consider, when I say you, it's really your company because I think you and your company often aren't the same. Do your C-suite consider technology a pure expense or does the organization consider a technology a strategic asset, right? I can't tell you how many times by the time I get to the C-suite or I even get to the really purchasing too, that the technology that we're providing is just a line item on a spreadsheet on your P&L. And you got to get yourself and your C-suite to start thinking that this is a strategic asset and not just an expense. There's so many soft collar, soft dollar costs of savings that get to go into an ROI or a TCO that more open-minded forward thinking executives will allow those to be in my ROI TCO. Some very staunch um, CFOs don't believe in that. It's got to be hard dollars and we can generally win all arguments, but the soft cost, soft cost help a ton as well. So what do we have here? Uh, we have 24% say people view it as an expense and 79, God, those don't add up. So I don't get that. 80% Zoom's got to do some math here for me. Uh, I've got 80%, 81 on strategic asset and 23 on expense for 104% uh, total. So uh, some math problems there, but I think we got the idea. The common thinking is a strategic asset. So I'll end the poll. I think I can share the results. So pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. I'll stop sharing that. Move that over. So we did a um, a blog two weeks ago. Hopefully you guys follow our blogs, and um, they're on our website. They're fun stuff. Um, last one was the evolution of IT. And, you know, it really started people dealing with speed speeds, bits, bytes, pliers, wires, we call them server huggers, blinky lights. People like to go into the back room and see the physical equipment. And, and okay, I get it. Then it moved to the colo, like, well, it's not here anymore. It's over there, but you're still kind of managing it over there. You still have to deal with it. And then it gets to the, the management of the applications, not so much the, the upkeep and the support of it, but the management of it. So now when the call center agent uh, manager wants a new report or a call center add an agent or the salesperson wants to add a new salesperson or the recording needs to be found that was recorded for the Zoom call, all that's under IT. But in, in reality, we need to get IT to think in different terms now that their job is not to support these applications. Of course, this is a tough one, it is, but not to support the applications. We need to get these applications to someone else to manage or more importantly, get them to the cloud so the cloud manages itself, right? So you're not dealing with servers and upgrades and OS and da, 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 da. Most things are web-based and they're in the cloud and somebody else is managing them. And now you can give 
management to the contact center supervisor to run their own reports, the contact center manager to add an agent. You can give something to the facilities person to add a new phone. You can give something to the salesperson to do a new report, the salesperson to work at home. All these applications that you used to do are now just a checkbox, you know, a, a, a ability to delegate this to business line owners. And this now allows them to get quicker responses and you to work on business outcomes. So you need to raise your bar. And now you need to be start to think about, you know, higher level applications, higher level outcomes, as opposed to blinky lights and keeping servers on. Because if you think about the left-hand side and don't make it to the right-hand side, you're going to be lost and you're going to be left behind in this world. So the question is, where do you fit? So this was uh, instilled in me as a business owner a long, long time ago, and it and and the and the the tides have finally shifted for me. When I first bought Packet Fusion 21 years ago, that's an amazing time. Can't believe it's been that long. I had to work in the business. I was doing everything right because we were 10 people. We're 55, 60 now, and I get to delegate, and I've got a lot of really, really strong people that work with us, and so now I get to work on the business. And, and a lot of that is I have people in scale and get to do this, but it's also, I have the right tools that we've selected and the applications that we work on that the business line owners can all do their job without having to be, get people to work in the business. So our goal is to get you guys to think about things differently. Let us help you find the right applications, the right technologies that allow you to work in your business, on your business and not in your business. So that's my part. The next part, we're going to talk about the different technologies, about where we fit in, how we plan them, how we prescribe the different technologies, and kind of the questions we ask to get people to think about things differently. And this is where Bill uh, Franklin's going to come in and do his part. We'll, we'll, this will be a, uh, an open session for us going back and forth. So Bill, be prepared for me to pepper you with questions too. I'm always prepared, Matt. It's uh, that's one of my favorite things is being in a um, kind of just open environment like this. It, it should be open. These are not normal times. These are not normal discussions. This is moving your business forward. And I love that quote. Work on your business, not be in it. And that couldn't be more prevalent than today because obviously what we've all gone through as a as a global you know pandemic as a, as just an entity. I think. When you did that poll and you said 90% it was affected and 10% wasn't, I think they were already working from home anyway, right? Um, so what is the new normal? And I always like this open conversation because we've seen, and I live out of Chicago and you can see behind me, that's not Chicago, but corporate real estate in Chicago, New York and major metropolitans have gone down. And the main reason is we're, we're getting into this work from home. So Ellen, if you're controlling or Matt, you go to the next one because really the work from home is going to be here to stay and we know that how will it affect your business and what does that mean we can have that open discussion and how you're going to secure it where the applications are and now more than ever um ransomware and users are clicking on everything and and we have to be mindful of that so education understanding and understanding from a network side and what you're doing to the business is paramount and are you going to go to a minimal corporate real estate and distribution or are you going to stay about the same? That these are conversations we have to sit down and, and diagnose. And how much of the business do you want to be in, and how much of it do you want to work on the business? So hit the next one because really, when Matt talked about business outcomes, I'm a big fan of. Oh, go back one. It's yeah, good. I'm there. a big fan of kind of what what are what are we trying to solve for? Business outcomes are one thing. A lot of that, we're, we're piecing together uh, the drivers. Okay, well, more than ever, people are looking to either cost reduct, reduce, and that could be in public cloud, AWS, Azure, GCP, or private cloud, or you're trying to get out of your data center business and those capital expenditures. As Ellen um, eloquently put my background, which is probably one of the best ones I've heard. So um, I come from the CapEx world, EMC, NetApp, and I know the games they play. I know the games Cisco plays. And a lot of times, CFOs and business owners want a little bit more level set from a, from a cost perspective. And how do we do that? Is that just CapEx to OpEx or can we 
operationalize even the most mundane tasks. A absolutely. And me coming into this managed services, cloud environment, however way you want to describe it, um, we've been able to accomplish that. So a lot of times nowadays, everything's a little bit on the table, lack of a better term, because people have a cloud first strategy or a cloud only strategy, which I heard one customer recently told me, I'm like, that's kind of new. That was our customer. That was last week. Yeah, a cloud only. And cloud only. It, I'm like, and sometimes you're like, well, why would you not if you take a step back and see your business as an entity and be like, well, I want in three to five years completely out of the data center business. So you have to project today, leadership says this is our model going forward and bring down based on that level of governance, how are we going to transact in the future? Scalability, work from home, pretty well defined in terms of the business drivers. And that last one is obviously board, senior leadership at organizations and mergers and acquisitions, all very relevant and aren't gonna go away anytime soon. We just have to be in front of it and steering the ship in the right direction. Um, so the next part is my version and as Ellen was talking, I used to whiteboard a lot when I was at EMC and NetApp, and usually that was sysadmin, maybe IT manager. But the whiteboard still is a great medium for us in front of business owners and quite honestly, you know, VP of networking or infrastructure. But to steer the business and talk through the equation of the right people, process, and technology, as Matt was alluding at the beginning, because those three have to come together if the business is going to shift. Um, the one I haven't put up there and I'd ask for you, I'm like, it looks good. You know, six low key drivers. I'm probably missing a bunch. One of them that I always miss is business continuity, disaster recovery. I mean, out of San Francisco, I saw people, you know, putting up some blurbs and, you know, welcome from San Francisco. I mean, a lot of times you're trying to mitigate against that. Obviously you don't want to be in the Bay area. You want to get into, well, should I go to Las Vegas? Should I go to Utah? Should I go to Denver or Chicago, wherever from a disaster recovery and business continuity planning? All that is on the table. Matt, take us to the next one and then build out kind of the first couple. I don't want to keep talking to you here. So the legacy on-prem, we understand a lot of customers have been transitioning for a while. And usually they start with the major players. Like you said, Matt, Salesforce and ServiceNow or Workday. And honestly, this, this is a huge industry. Right. I mean, I think the concept here is, I don't know if you saw the slide build is, you know, one, at one point, these applications all were on big servers in your back office and your colo, but you manage these things and you were dealing with the blinky lights and now they're in the cloud, but they're still on some legacy WAN connectivity from your workloads and your applications on-prem people to get to this new cloud infrastructure. And you have to talk about, and I just got off the phone earlier today, a customer I want to have Meraki at four locations. They only have four. I have about hundred employees. And I'm like, okay, what are your biggest problems? And you had the CEO on with the VP of infrastructure and the CEO is saying, I want the VP out of the day-to-day -day management. I want them working on um, customer facing enterprises. I'm like, okay, well then we're gonna have to take some mundane tasks off his plate, which is ISP. Some of the blocking and tackling of the Meraki devices or other uh, security devices too, because the workloads are shifting. It doesn't mean I want my network team or my one uh, lead working on all the mundane tasks. So as you build this out, a lot of times customers do have that legacy on-prem PBX, which hopefully Packet Fusion was managing or, or still is. But also this is a huge market and Matt and Alex are very passionate about it and, and I am too. And we can di dive deep into it. I think we have a use case coming up here, Alex, um, towards the end. And this has been tried and true. And now we have Zoom and Ring Central. And as Matt was alluding, this this industry has been gravitating toward that as a service for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to put it in perspective, when COVID hit, we have you know we've taken about two hundred of our customers and put them in a cloud for UC and you in, in contact center, which is really cool. That still leaves four hundred and fifty of our customers still on premise hardware based equipment. And when COVID hit and we're trying to make this premise based equipment act like cloud because everybody's at home, 
we ran into some problems, right? So we had to private cloudize, if that's a word, their <laughs> MyTel, Shortel infrastructure to allow people to work at home. And it worked as best as we could get it done. And we got some people couldn't get past certain things and it wouldn't work for them. So guess what? We quickly moved them to one of the cloud providers you have there, some Zoom, some 8x8, some Ring Centrals, incredibly quickly. Um, others, we figured out how to get their premise-based stuff to work for them remotely. Um, but then we've now accelerated their digital transformation plan to get them to cloud in not such a gun to your head, let's get there because it's just not working, but a gun to your head, but a, a nice prescriptive manner of here's how we're going to get you there. And the prescriptive but, nature a lot of times comes into that, are we going to stay hybrid now? And what is our um, ability for any user to then access a cloud, right? Do I have to backhaul to my data center? Can I go over the internet? Is that secure? Is it not? And the next version of the digital transformation kind of has to start in the middle of this, meaning I want more going there. And maybe they're all lo local in the Bay Area for workloads. I, I don't know. And maybe internet is rich, but a lot of times we're dealing with dispersed regions, whether you're going up north, um, east, west, doesn't matter. And you have ISPs. And a lot of times you're dealing not even with fiber, you're dealing with broadband, you're dealing with secondary circuits that don't enable the business. And we have to take another look at how we design business continuity for my users to get to the application. And I love it because when I build infrastructure, I used to build infrastructure on-prem, that's five nines of availability or higher. Now I move a workload to, to a cloud, there's no way a carrier is gonna say we have five nines availability. They're gonna have a lot of jitter loss, latency, and just the ability to traverse more and more customers over it, you, you know you have to have a better internet or a better backbone. And that's where SD-WAN and Matt touched on a new term Gartner came out with, with his SASE. Basically it's network uh, carriers, but just ISP and then all things carrier based and network security coming to one to offer it quote unquote as a service. Hey, Firewall hey. as a service, security gateway. Can I have SD-WAN? Can I have all these ingredients from one maybe two at the most, but from one provider, yes. And that's Bill, super exciting stuff. I, I love where you're going. The slide's amazing, but I'm even gonna just break it down just at the most fundamental level. Like the, the need for this new type of architecture of the WAN is just fundamentally because your applications don't reside at your premise anymore. And it wasn't this network where your remote office had to come back to your campus, your HQ to get to that application, right? That was the old school. Now that this stuff is in the cloud, I don't need this big fancy MPLS network for my inner office communications to have no applications that are housed there, right? So that's why MPLS is going away less and less. It's still there and it's still needed. And there's still definitely plans for it. And don't get me wrong, but people are shifting to this SD-WAN SASE model because I need to now get closer to these applications, the SAS that you see and the more that are about to be about to build out. And the MPLS doesn't get that. I can now save money, better bandwidth, closer to my applications, better fault tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. This whole middle slide that we're showing you here is a full hour presentation. And so there's so many ways to skin a cat on SD-WAN and SASE from yeah. hardware, you own it, to MSP, somebody else helps out with it, from carriers doing it. Bill, keep going, keep riffing on that. And the biggest problem there is the confusion now to the end user customer, right? You started off your presentation as, I have a hammer, so everything's a nail. In this category, more than ever, oh. it's not that way. It's what are we dealing with? Maybe you have some legacy Cisco, or I just had to call this customer this morning. They're like, they have a ton of Palo Alto. And we're like, well, that's where we should start. You have technical debt, assets from people, process, and technology already built in. Whatever the case may be, that's where we have to start. And so this offers a ton of confusion to customers, but it's such a necessity. It's kind of what a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, owns a car, uh, an auto body dealer locally. And I go, hey, is it? Is it accurate? Kind of oil is the most important thing to your to your car's engine, right? He's like, absolutely. So this is always what I think is my engine from a car perspective, and <laughs> can't really talk about it if you have a electrical vehicle. But the the oil is 
is the most important. So the network is kind of the oil to how your people are going to access applications. And well, if you, I mean, keep yeah, go going on this. You, the, my first slide, the hammer nail thing. So now you're going to go run this process, and I want to go look at Palo Alto, Fortinet, and Versa. So now you're going to get the sales rep, the sales engineer from each one of these guys to come in here, and they're going to tell you why their product is the best. They're going to understand your needs. And they're going to shoehorn their product into your into your network, right? Whereas we take a more prescriptive approach, and we understand exactly what you're doing, where things reside, your posture, security posturing, what how you do things, and then we're going to go find the right product with you and make sure that that product works for you, right? We're not tied to any vendor anymore. That's the beautiful thing. We represent all these vendors and we get to come up with the perfect solution for you guys. And it's just so liberating for me to be able to do this. It's just like, I know that I'm solving customer problems for them on a daily basis. Yep, and, and you just said it right. One of my favorite customers I, I reference as an architecture perspective, uh, they brought Cisco, um, they were going to Zscaler and they had a lot of legacy IBM and they were going to go to Office 365. Very recently, they're going to Office 365, right? So I said, okay, you got Cisco. Have you heard of VeloCloud? They're like, actually, we're a heavy VMware shop. Okay, so good. So we looked at VeloCloud and they saw Zscaler's price point and we moved them over to Checkpoint Firewall because of the price point per meg was so much cheaper than, than Zscaler. So we're building the architecture, and then we wrapped it around with one service provider. Their, their name is on here too as well. So what you just talked about is it doesn't matter. Don't listen to everybody. We can still round it out to what's best for you. And that that is night and day different than any other sales rep will ever talk I, about. I hope you're going to get to this, Bill, this, the bottom portion of this, because this deserves an hour presentation on its <laughs> own. But five exactly. minutes on MSP. Are you going there or should I go there? You go ahead. Um, that's who I was talking about is the MSP. Was yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to dig in a little bit more so people truly appreciate this, right? So, you know, we have a couple of our larger retail customers that have, you know, so they have multiple broadbands. They have a DIA. They have security firewall. They have Wi-Fi. They have switching. They have UCAS and point of sale. So literally they have all these seven different things to handle a single, you know, grocery store. And it gets cumbersome when you multiply that times 500. And now you as the entity that owns the responsibility for these 500 and locations with seven different vendors, let alone maybe even on the carrier side, you might have 20 or 30 different carriers. That is a disaster. That's a major headache. Again, get out of the day-to-day, -day, get higher level work on the applications and the business processes. There's the new term called managed service provider, MSP, where they're basically an aggregator of the top of the products above you from carrier to hardware to, to processes. They're a management of all of that. So on a single bill, they can give you 10 different carriers, 30 different locations, backup, fail over to 5G. They can give you the UCAS, the CCAS, the Wi-Fi, the security, all in a single bill, all from a single person to call for tech support, all with us helping you manage the whole thing too. Bill, hopefully I did it justice. Please oh, yeah. oh, always. And it's weird to hear that. And it sounds too good to be true, but they truly are an MSP and they, they get judged on their NPS score, which is that net promoter score too as well. So I mean, um, we, we, and I love, this is from Bill directly. Like, so we'll go talk to some of our bigger customers and they're caught up with, you know, Verizon and Macer G yeah. and AT&T. And we're like, great, they're going to do a good job for you. But look at these guys below the lines. You probably never even heard of these guys and what they do and how they do it is amazing. And about half the time we've conv we convince them like, wow, this is the way to go. How did I not know about these guys or this whole world? And so it's a, it's a bit of an education process, uh, maybe a bit of a leap of faith that you got to trust us to at least take a, take a look at these guys because these guys are winning so many deals. It's kind of the next generation where things are going. So much so that the carriers are now getting into MSP, like TPX, they're now, they don't even have a network anymore. They are an MSP. Yep. So everybody's trying to follow this business model and you're gonna see more and more of it over the next three to five years. Do me a favor on the next three clouds, build them out together. I like to analyze it together, right? A lot of customers, especially out, out West started in AWS or have gone there, right? And a lot of times you're trying to reduce the bill or do a cost analysis versus another one. That, those are all very prevalent. And me being <clears throat> from the infrastructure game and understanding oversubscription and oversubscribed and all the other fun 
little things, I like to talk through, okay, what's the right cloud for the right workload or what's the right workload for the right cloud? It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I didn't build it. I just made it better. Meaning, do we bring it to a MSP for a single tenant? Do we go to a multi-tenant uh, secure one or just move it to a better multi-cloud or a hyperscaler model as well? All of this is on the table and you might even thought of that too as well. And that bottom one down there helps fulfill the support model and the technology. Again, we're more around the people process and technology. So what those people think of them as the aggregator, they can help just better support AWS, Azure, GCP, heck Oracle's now in there and stuff like that. We got a poll. I just launched a poll. Yep. I'm sure you all see it. It's very obtrusive. You can't miss yep. it. Love for you to answer this. We love getting good data. We'll share it all with you <laughs> when we send out the recording of this. So yeah. please answer. Hey, Bill, quick question. Great one. I could do it. I think you'd be more prone to do it. It might even be more relevant to wait to the next slide, but it could be here. Um, an SD-WAN approach is a great one for decentralizing connectivity, therefore bandwidth latency. How do you apply a centralized approach with cybersecurity and compliance firewalls in this environment? Well, if you want to keep backhauling and centralize things, you know, what are the latent issues, latency meaning to get back to the backhaul, if you want to centralize? What a lot of people, and this is the specific reason why you'll see more cloud gateway model pops, um, because you can decentralize things, but still have the overall policy. A lot of people are calling it an orchestrator. So you don't have to tell that into a lot of the firewalls and routers. Nope, you set out a policy based on routing and where are the users gonna access? The key there, the key is always, these are application focused devices. So if you're gonna centralize it and you just want one egress point to get there from a cybersecurity model, we can build that. But what most people have done is more of a regional, what I call a regional hub and spoke on a security model. So I'll take like the Bay Area, and maybe like Denver or Chicago or something more central, depending on where the applications are at and build repetitive. But I might need a cloud-based firewall in that because you don't want to build out a data center or have a backhaul to another regional facility that might have limited internet. So we, we have to dig into the nuts and bolts of it, but I've seen more decentralized with cybersecurity being number one paramount on the redesign of the network. Absolutely. It, it just depends on a little bit of the ingredients that we have to build on. Alan, we'll, we can take that offline and have as long as a detailed conversation as you want. Yeah. Um, we can do that another time. Thank you for the question, guys. Keep keep coming with these questions. That was a great one. We love the little tangents riffing on this stuff. So yeah, that was, um, that was definitely in the, in the weeds a little bit and, and yeah, we got to dive into that. I love yeah. that. So uh, you saw the poll in the last one, some good stuff on the UCAS. Everybody's going to UCAS. Here's one for uh, SD-WAN or SASE. It's about a two thirds, one third. Hopefully the one third already has it or there's a fundamental reason why they're not doing it. Um, and there are, right? There are still people, I get it. There's one of my customers wants to get to SD-WAN but they will keep their MPLS as their primary and they'll fail over to a broadband with, with SD-WAN doing that. And once that's proved out, They'll make the broadband the primary, get rid of SD, get rid of MPLS, and then put a secondary broadband in. So it's like this, this slow roll. So there's no right yeah. or wrong with any of this. It's your comfort level, it's your you know, cost threshold, it's your you know, fault tolerance, it's your um, desire for uptime. Um, so all those go into our methodology of how we design it and what vendors we bring in to, to provide solutions. And keep in mind, anything we talk, SD-WAN, SASE, they POC it first. We have to prove out the model. And I always like using the term an exit strategy off of MPLS, but by no means is it going to happen day one, right? We have to prove it out the model and that's okay. Um, because if anybody comes in and says it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, just, just kick them out until you prove it. And I have no problem saying that. All right, you good here or? Yep, yep. And the last one, by no means is at least, um, when you're looking at that um, poll right there and we start talking about SD-WAN and SASE, which is the basically securing the edge. And I like how 65% um, in the next 12 months look for SD-WAN. 
uh, and or no, it might just be your one site uh, or minimal sites. And that's fine. Uh, again, I was dealing with someone this morning with three sites, but you were just going to use your Meraki to terminate two locations. And that might be SD-WAN and that might be okay for people. But we still have to take in mind, especially now with solar winds and all eyes on down channel and downstream is how do you gain revenue as an entity? Who are your customers? People are going to start asking you for your security posture. What are you using for ransomware, anti-malware, whatever? They are going to start asking for that. And we have a whole program around diagnosing um, where you're at today and where you want to be from a cybersecurity framework too. Well, the, big, so. the big one for now is that our customers and quite frankly us too uh, got hit with is do you store customers' home addresses on your infrastructure? If so, do you do this? Bang, bang, bang. You know, the 30 questionnaire that you have to answer. So, you know, we help with these questionnaires and if you can't answer them to the you know, sufficed of the persons provided for you, we have the technology to help you get there. Yeah, and, and not, and vulnerability pen tests obviously have to be done for compliance and should be done just as a day-to-day -day operation, I shouldn't say day-to-day, -day, but every six months or so, um, that's just normal. But now more than ever, people are starting to ask, like, if I do the pen test, okay, what's my strategy to move me forward? Because I might have limited advice Plus, I would like to have a third-party cybersecurity expert tell me what everybody has been doing and am I okay, right? Kind of have that health check, if you will. Yeah. A professional service been, engagement, that is paramount, right? Yeah, this has been a big boom for us in the last, God, six, eight months. Um, you know, we, we, our customers are asking us for this type of stuff and we've got some very nice, some cookie cutter, some very elaborate types of, of, of vulnerability assessment. So the difference is the vulnerability assessment is basically done inside out. You put some some um, probes on your network. It looks around for all open holes and you know bad ports and you know mismatches and old software and holes and protocols and da 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 da. And then we take that vulnerability assessment. We present it. We try to patch things up and get it good. We do another one. Okay, you've passed that. And then okay, now. Let's do a penetration test. This is from the outside in. Let's try to break this thing. And then th these are two separate events and try to do a penetration test. We've had a ton of our customers um, ask for these and they range from, you know, minimums probably five grand. Um, we're doing one right now. Hopefully Alex is getting the uh, okay for that one for $50,000. And these aren't done just once a year. I mean, one, once right. and you're done, they generally do it once a year. A lot of our customers are doing once a quarter. I have one of my customers that we presented this to and they go, oh, we're already doing it. Well, best practices is you should alternate providers, right? Do one this quarter of these guys and then do another one with another quarter of these guys. So just, if these guys miss something, these guys won't. So this has been something that's been a real big um, boom for our guys. We love it. If you're interested, we can get, it, get in touch with you and talk to you more about it. So uh, let's end the poll. This is pretty interesting here. This is a good one. Let's share the results here. So never nine, uh, thirty percent have never done a vent. I, please, this is not a big dollar amount to do this. Right, it'll let you sleep better at night knowing where your holes in holes are. You know, anywhere from five grand up, and you get all the relevant information. Last six months, forty percent. Last twelve months, thirty percent. Okay, good. So people are doing them. This is good. We'd love to help. Yep, and I'll close with kind of that whiteboarding model, what we just talked about, kind of rounding it out. That's exactly our strategy is where are you at in this hybrid model? What are you trying to do from a business outcome? And then put those pieces in place knowing probably more than ever cybersecurity in 2021 could be the most paramount um, challenge you have for gaining new revenue as a business entity if your ducks aren't in a row, lack of a better term. So um, probably talk too much, but Matt, you know, thanks for that. No, I'll stay on and wind you up and let you go thank you so we talked a lot about a bunch of different products a bunch of different offerings a bunch of different industries we, everything we showed you there we play in and and some at different levels than others right from our our world our genesis is the you know unified communications contact center world so uh, we're certified and direct 
implementers of these products that you see here for UCAS phone systems, you know, unified communications, as well as CCAS uh, contact center stuff. And we've got some, uh, some nice use cases that we'll talk to in a, in a little bit. But these are things that we can, we can project manage, we can implement, we can design, we can troubleshoot, we can you know, help with peripherals, we can help with networking, we can help with porting, we can help with um, analog, we can help with taking your existing database from whatever it's in and migrating it to the new, not saying we wanna duplicate, but you got a lot of good valuable stuff in your existing stuff, let us help you get it and decipher it into the new stuff. Um, some of this goes on our paper. Most of this goes direct with one of the manufacturers and then they pay us on the backside. So the contract is generally direct with one of these providers and we have a relationship with them where they pay us on the backside. We still have a ton of people that uh, we do consulting for. We're not officially certified on these guys. Actually, we are on Intellipeer. That should be over there. But uh, we still sell a bunch of these guys and we offer, you know, our industry expertise, such as project management, you know, some SIP expertise, VoIP expertise, networking expertise, cutover expertise, you know, laying out of phones expertise, all those types of things. Um, and then it's kind of the stuff that we were talking about on the slide before, from collaboration and video to next generation network, SASE. Um, it's hard to be certified on all of those. We are incredibly knowledgeable about concepts and routing and how it all works. Um, so we add a ton of value that way, but we're not generally certified to a level on all these products on the, on the right. We are on most of them, but we still manage and we'll see a project through from start to finish, which we're gonna to get to in a second here. So we got 10 minutes left. Alex, do we do a Pathfinder demo? Um, yeah, we could do a quick two to three minute one and then go into customer testimonials. Yeah, all right, you are now sharing. All right. So here, here's a, uh, a tool that we utilize, a question we get asked when, um, when we present this information to our customer base and to new customers is how do we stay up on top of all the information that's going out there? Uh, the, all the intellectual property, the changes in the ecosystem. And so as Packet Fusion has made our transformation, we've had some key hires and um, some key partnerships that we've realigned our organization with. And one of the tools that we utilize is what we call our Pathfinder. Um, what I'm going to show you here for two minutes is literally just scratching the service surface. So I encourage you to reach out to uh, Matt and he'll set up a call with one of our solutions consultants to dive deeper into this as well. Um, but to give you a breadth kind of of our overall portfolio, this represents probably about 60% of the organizations and the cloud service providers, MSP security organizations we work with out there. You can see some of the biggest names in the market and then some very niche providers that do one or two things extremely well and have some very high net promoter scores. All of these organizations are vetted before um, we even put them in front of you and your organization. And as we look through this, there's a couple, I'm gonna to touch base on the interactive assessments and dynamic matrices, but this data center locator is extremely powerful for, extremely powerful for co-location and data center opportunities out there. If you're looking for diversification around the globe, we can actually go in and tour data centers. I can tell you what compliance, what level of networking, on net carriers, direct connect, even risk tolerance that have to do with nuclear or earthquakes are built into this tool. The next one's our fiber locator tool, represents about 98% of the fiber laid around the world. I can tell you which, give me an address, we can tell you net, which carriers are on net at that location. Um, if it's a long haul, a local, also if there are different um, MPOs in a single building as well for diversification there. And then our, Interactive quick assessments, this is the fun one. Um, it is essentially a mini RFP in your hands. Everybody is looking for the day and excited for the day when we don't have to answer or build out RFPs and go through that painful process. And I'll show you kind of what the UCAS one looks like. Uh, it goes through and we get all of the discovery information that 
your IT organization would spend 15, 20 hours with an individual sales rep answering the same questions over and over again. And we have this all digitally uh, in our solution. We can send it over to you, fill out your own speed. And as soon as you click submit down here, it gets sent over to our solution to our architect team who then has a 48 hour SLA to come back with their findings um, and two or three recommendations so that we can cut through the noise of all the providers out there that can that tell you that they can do what they, you want them to do, but really it's all marketing fluff. And we'll see here, dynamic matrices. This is really, this tool has a lot of intellect, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence built into it and is always being updated by our solution architect team here. And you can see that we do have these matrices for all every single technology that we work with, everything from a, AWS, managed uh, service providers, UCAS, CCAS, and I'll go ahead and jump into the UCAS matrix. SIP, security, security is huge right now. We're doing a lot of opportunities there with customers. And, you know, the power of this tool is we are able to dive into each unique opportunity and provide truly agnostic feedback for your organization. And so you'll see the machine learning, artificial intelligence built in. It's gonna start moving and populating these providers around. Um, primary data center location, customer has, is headquartered in North America, but has offices in Europe. Um, compatible handsets. We actually just purchased a bunch of Polycom handsets and the CFO hasn't appreciated those completely. So we wanna repurpose those if at all possible. Um, Salesforce, huge Salesforce shop. We use it for sales, service. We actually even utilize Pardot on the marketing side for marketing automation, which is owned by Salesforce. Uh, productivity, right now we're at Google G Suite. We're a very uh, Bay Area focused. We're looking to be a web 3.0 company. Um, and we do handle some online payments. So PCI is a big one for us. Um, Gartner, our CEO is lives in breathes by Gartner and he won't purchase any technology that is not Gartner rated. So go ahead and pull that out. And you can see we start here and all the provider, the providers that check every single one of our boxes and requirements is there. As we break this down, it gives you sweet spot for the ideal customer profile, the organization, where their data centers are, if the platform is proprietary or white labeled and everything. And what I just did here in 30 seconds, we've seen IT staffs take months to put together, to have these conversations, to do this research. And this is one of the reasons why our clients are coming to us, looking for, looking for us to help them navigate the confusion that is cloud technologies. And so with that, I will pass it back over to Matt. All right, let's get back to where we were. All right, everybody's back to my uh, screen, I take it. So actually it's back to you, Alex. So we're gonna spotlight three customers Real quick, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to end on time. Um, so, Alex, why don't you go over this, these guys for you? This is one of my favorite success stories. Yeah, so this is a fun story. It's a uh, civil engineering firm based out of the Bay Area, uh, about 13 locations, 400 users. And I got in contact with them about a year and a half ago. They had brought on a new IT staff, and he inherited um, what we'd like to call a rat's nest, hodgepodge of uh, different systems, disparate systems, phone systems, had no idea what, what carriers were on that. Uh, they were built, they did have some sort of MPLS, but a lot of problems and no visibility. Um, and he was brought on to tighten things up and really be drive the next growth of the organization. Since then, they have doubled in size. And so there was a lot of hesitancy around growth due to the uh, IT systems not supporting the growth. And I'm just going to tell a story here. There's a lot of uh, bullet points that you can all read through. Um, this is a full engagement, trusted trusted advisor engagement, where we come in, understand, do a full needs analysis with the customer, 
Bill actually did a whiteboarding session that lasted about two and a half, three hours with the customer. But when we came out of that, we had a full network diagram of current state, future state, and a checklist of the next eight projects and what the 18 month roadmap looks like. And so what we were able to do is start block, block and tackling each of those projects, starting with network and SD-WAN and O365 migration, unified communication. Some of these things bounced around due to um, some unforeseen variables and security has become a huge thing for them. We're about six out of the eight projects that have been complete so far and we hold QBRs with their C-suite um, on a quarterly basis to show the progress that we have made and make sure that they are um, moving in the right direction along these projects. But it's really enabled the cap the organization to go from a CapEx financial model to OpEx. We have real-time data analytics that the organization is able to make decisions based off of, not quarterly, post-quarterly reviews. And they were actually completely ready for the... Uh, work from home environment that we all experience. So my, my favorite thing here, Alex, is, you know, we used to be a phone system vendor and we've five years ago, obviously we've made the transition, but I think this is the customer, one of the customers that you've sold or we've sold the most, provided the most different solutions for from 365 to UCAS to security to SD-WAN to SASE, all the different things. This is the pinnacle of what we're trying to do. And it's, it, you, you brought to life, it's nice work. I'm going to skip this next one. I'm going to go to a quick one for us on the healthcare side, 3,000 employees. These guys um, do their business through acquisition. They acquired a customer that I've been maintaining for eight years. Um, they got off of the system that I had been supporting for a long time, but the guy, the CFO, CIO remembered me and two years ago called me up and said, Matt, we now need to take our 12 different phone systems and bring them into one. And they were getting just hammered on customer support, just hammered on no, no omni-channel, no updating, all the stuff that they do to deliver CPAPs, uh, oxygen, wheelchairs, all the different things that they have to, that the uh, insurance companies need to provide. They're the ones, they're the logistics behind this, all this. They just acquired another customer, another customer of 3,000 agents. So they're at 24 agents, 2,400 agents today, going to about 5,000 by the end of the year but we ran our whole analysis for them and um, did you know, probably about three months worth of, four, six months of incredible work for them to get them with proof of concepts, total cost of ownerships, surveys. We wrote an executive summary and helped them with the contract negotiation. So um, we're gonna get to a little bit more of this here. So if you guys need a vulnerability assessment or penetration test, we'd love to help on the security side of the house, um, MSSP or a CISO. Uh, what we also do is more of a prescribed message methodology where we can come into the SMB um, and understand what you guys are doing and give you a, a roadmap of how to get to the next generation cloud technologies for everything. And this is a um, very clean uh, manner for us to give to you guys to get there quickly. Um, what we do for our larger um, more enterprise customers is do a full migration strategy and roadmap and timeline and understand every one of these things and how they fit in and deliver a nice uh, proposal back to you and how things should be managed and what you should all do. If we then identify one of these projects, we then jump into our process and our process is truly digging in, understanding your business process, understanding what's going on with your infrastructure, we create a, a needs requirement from that, from interviewing all the different players in the different uh, arenas from sales to contact center to HR, to facilitate all the different groups to understand their, their needs. Um, create basically a criteria for evaluation, um, mini RFP, if you will. Uh, vendor, we figure out what vendors are gonna be provided for this, are gonna bid on this. Uh, proof of concept, we manage that. Uh, we create an evaluation survey for the people who are part of the uh, proof of concept. Once that's done, we've picked our horse. We create the uh, help create the executive summary in a very, very detailed, as detailed as you want it, TCO. We help with contract negotiations. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, I've got 55 people that are being trained on all the different products that we support. 
So we help implement and ongoing support. So we're 102, we're gonna wrap it up with, with this. Um, so you, you have the time, you should have the time once we get you to the right applications to basically run your business, right? Right now you're working in your business and we want you to work on your business. Let us spot the trends, that's what we do. Let us help you get to the right technologies. Let us help you talk about what's coming next, where things are going. Obviously you need to stay, stay well aware of that, but that's what we do for a living. So partner with us, let us help you show the, let us show you the way. Um, and please reach out to me, uh, Matt M. Pingator at PacketFusion.com if you want to follow up with anything or presentations or anything piqued your interest, you want to dig in a little bit more. So thank you guys so much.